Sports and TV. This is NTV. It is 9 p.m. in Kampala this Friday night, the 24th day of August 2012, and the weekend starts here. You are right on time for tonight's NTV Weekend Edition. Tonight, assessing the 9th Parliament. Find out what the Uganda National NGO Forum has had to say on the performance so far. Plus, the mayor of Kawempe Mubarak Munyagwa is arrested for trying to hold yet another demonstration. We'll be bringing you all the drama from the day. Good evening, I'm Josephine Karunji. Let's begin with the headlines. Assessing the Ninth Parliament, the Uganda National NGO Forum cites the growing problem of late coming and the lack of coordination in the opposition. The mayor of Kawempe Mbarak Munyagwa has yet again been arrested following another demo. Join me Suhail Mugabe as I give you the details of this story in our weekend edition. I'm Chris Ochamringa to bring you a story about a case in which the acting director of the East African Civil Aviation Academy is charged with embezzlement. The World Football Governing Body FIFA has finally come out strongly cautioning players and officials overstating with the Uganda Super League. Join me, Alfred Odom, for the details of that story and some individuals who attempted to interrupt the FIFA assembly. Once again, welcome to NTV Weekend Edition. I am Josephine Karunji. Now, first tonight, the Citizens' Assessment of the Ninth Parliament indicates that it has, in the first year, performed better than the Eighth Parliament, scoring 60% in terms of its various roles, which include legislation and oversight. 
These are the findings of a report released today by Uganda National NGO Forum titled The Parliament Watch Bulletin, which also cited different factors that have hindered Parliament from performing even better. These include executive influence let coming by legislators, lack of coordination among opposition members, and a lack of skills to peruse issues concerning human rights. However, some members of parliament feel that the report should have also evaluated the electorate, who always demand better from their leaders. City of Hunger starts us off tonight. It's been, there have been some common features that we have noticed, including one, one party dominance, but with an emerging opposition. Despite excelling in the above areas, the ninth parliament scored only 60% in the general performance, thus bringing into question what went wrong. One of the major reasons that has continuously affected the performance of parliament is late coming and poor attendance of committees, plenary and other sessions. Even what they are supposed to deliberate on either is above their capacity to deliver the research findings represent different views of the people and according to the majority of them, they feel parliament has failed to play its cardinal role, which is legislation that determines the legal arena of the country. For example, out of the 28 bills which were left by the 8th parliament, only four of them have been passed, while others remain in question. Of course, most people wanted the public order and management bill to be thrown out of parliament because they believe it's unconstitutional and it's unfortunate it's still among the list. But some MPs argue that even if all the bills were to be passed in policies catering for the public interest, the executive is the one who determines whether or not they make any sense. And therefore it's also wrong to expect parliament to overstep that limitation because it's deliberate. One of the key areas that Parliament has done well is that of open debate, although some people claim that the Deputy Speaker of Parliament compromised his independence for the good of the party, which they feel affects the general performance of the August House. His participation in some of the meetings of the NRM caucus when we were discussing uh, business that was before Parliament. I want to state that our speakers, both the Speaker and the Deputy Speaker, are highly professional. Another area with a lot of tension is lack of coordination with the opposition that is supposed to provide alternative legislation in Parliament. Opposition needs to understand that they have a role to be able to lead and prepare themselves for leadership uh, and they can only do that if they are serious about that business. Many legislators argue that it is high time the civil society and other partners educate the public on the roles of an MP, most notably development service delivery. I've just put a coffee as I was sitting there. Is that the role of an MP? People are going back to school, university last week. It is hell for MPs. According to the Citizens Manifesto, parliamentarians need to represent good qualities of leaders such as being honest, God-fearing, accountable, take responsibility when they go wrong, among others. And critics say that if the legislators shift from these principles, they're likely to do a disservice to the country. Sudil Biarhanga, NTV. Thank you, Sudil. It is on that issue that we engage you tonight in our NTV Weekend Poll. And we are asking, what is your assessment of the performance of the Ninth Parliament in its first year? I repeat, what is your assessment of the performance of the Ninth Parliament in its first year? To have your say, text 8778, followed by your name and where you are texting from. We shall be reading some of your comments during tonight's newscast and some more towards the end of this bulletin. Moving on, the leader of opposition, Nathan Nandala Mafabi, has reshuffled his cabinet, bringing in new faces, letting go of some old guards, and bringing back on board the ministers who had stepped aside pending investigations into their collaboration with government. He announced the changes this morning at a news conference at Parliament. Beatrice Atimanwa, the woman MP for Kitkum, who had stepped aside pending investigations into her conduct with government officials, has bounced back and has retained her seat as Energy, Oil and Mineral Resources Shadow Minister. Betty Omogi has been dropped as UPC Chief Whip and has been replaced by a new entrant, Father Jacinto Ogwal. Stephen Ochola was also dropped and replaced by a new entrant, Honorable Bernard Atiku, the MP for Ayivu County, who is now the new Youth Minister. Honorable Gilbert Olanya, a new face in the Shadow Cabinet, takes up the Lands and Physical Planning's Ministry. 
Benson Obuogwa was another minister who lost his seat to Andrew Allen, the MP for Bugabula North County, who now becomes the Communications ICT Science and Technology Minister. Honorable Fula Ogutu has been moved from Information Minister and taken to the Works and Infrastructure Development Ministry, while Simu Junganda is the new Information and National Guidance Minister after being moved from the Lands and Physical Planning's Ministry. Honorable Meda Maxwell has been dropped as Vice Chairperson for the Public Accounts Committee and replaced by Honorable Paul Mwiru. Honorable Taewa Odo is also the new Vice Chair for the Local Government's Accounts Committee. The rest of the cabinet posts remain as they were. Now lawmakers hailing from Karamoja sub-region are demanding for an independent ministry from the Prime Minister's office. Addressing the reporters at Parliament this morning, the MPs said the office of the Prime Minister is so compacted with ministries. Now, though they appreciate government allocation of funds to begin the construction of Namaru na Kapiripiriti in Karamoja, it is a drop in the ocean. We recommend that Karamoja programs should be housed and directly managed by the Minister of Karamoja Affairs. And a PS be appointed for the Ministry for proper direct management and accountability. If the donors who are giving support or partners who are giving support to Karamoja, to be comfortable, we believe the Ministry must be removed from OPM. Because there is a lot of money and I think when donors are disappointed, they will pull out and Karamoja will still remain behind. When I visited my, co my cousins two weeks ago, I was stuck. For two days, I slept in the bushes. When I came back to Kampala, I informed this to the ministers, together with my colleagues. We informed them about the situation. The minister of state who went there to Karamoja also got stuck. Then we told him, oh, your comrade, how did you test it? He said, yeah, it really it, it is not a good experience. Traveling to Nairobi was easier than traveling to Karamoja. Six hours, eight hours to Nairobi, one week to Karamoja in Uganda. Saying for this bus to move smoothly through the journey of 2016, then the roads must be complete. Now we call upon the government that these roads that are left to link Karamoja to the rest of Uganda should be completed. Where is this party? Where are people partying? And the Karamoja are not part of this party. Where there is this enjoyment? So Karamoja once more has got on its feet. We are not going to turn back. Now work has remained paralyzed at Chambog University for a second day as the workers' strike continues to bite. Teaching and other activities remain at a standstill as the employees continue to lay down their tools. The standoff that began on Wednesday evening and was sparked by the decision of the University Council that the Vice-Chancellor will not be forced to step aside. As the university workers proceed with laying down their tools, the University Council tonight remains adamant. On Wednesday this week, the University Council decided that the Vice-Chancellor will not step aside with regard to accusations brought against him. This has since angered the employees, compelling them to go on strike for as long as the University Council stays glued to its decision. All the viewers, so long as you are the worker of Chambog University, you are supposed to keep at home, not until we do what? We call you back. And we shall not call anybody back into this university unless the VC steps aside for investigation. Currently, the university has come out with temporary means to survive during the strike, such as drafting in help with cooking and cleaning. A way forward is being crafted to ensure that uh, services can be delivered to our students. It appears that standoffs at universities are increasingly becoming rampant. Since the beginning of this year, over six major strikes have been witnessed in various universities in the country. Education consultant Fajul Mande attributes the situation to poor management skills by leaders and an attempt to copy from international institutions. An international arrangement which has been perpetuated and copied by local uh, populations up to the university level. A lot of leaders take long to listen to the complaints of the people and so 
people decide that I will go on strike because maybe that's the only language which people understand. He has advised various stakeholders at universities to use the law to present their demands and not resort to strike action. Cynthia Asio, NTV. <laughs> The mayor of Kawempe Mubarak, Munyagwa, has today been arrested for trying to hold another demonstration. Munyagwa and other members of the Muslim community are demanding the police produce a report following the recent deaths of three key Islamic figures in the country. Tejuma prayers at Wandegea Mosque. The mayor of Kawempe, Mubarak Munyagwa, took a stance calling on all Muslims to join him as he was planning on storming the police headquarters. Munyagwa Mbarak managed to gain some support from the mosque as he walked towards town until police intercepted and then arrested him. You're supposed to push me, okay? Not push me, okay? You're not supposed to push me. You're not supposed to push me, okay? Please don't push me this one. I'm a thief, eh? As you can see right now, Muslim clerics have gathered here at Wandegea police station demanding for the release of the Kawempe Mayor Munyagwa Mubarak, who has just been arrested by the police. Police are yet to release the findings of the inquiry into the deaths of Shay Abdul Hakim Sechimpi, Shay Sentam Abdul Karim, and Shay Abdul Majid Chugungu that was promised five months ago. <laughs> The head of operations in the central region, Daniel Omara, maintained that police will not tolerate any kind of demonstration. Release any tear gas? Now they don't want to release tear gas. We shall do the work of diffusing whatever thing. Meanwhile, police today were put to a task after timber dealers from Ndeba, Kampala suburb, took to the streets in protest of the National Forest Authority that has been confiscating their timber. Police could not contain these rowdy crowds that were soon growing in number, which prompted it to retaliate by firing tear gas to disperse them. In the end, police managed to disperse these crowds and also maintain the situation. Suhail Mugabe, NTV Weekend Edition. Thank you, Zuel. Let's now take a short break. There's still so much more ahead on NTV Weekend Edition, and this is what you can expect. The acting director of the East African Civil Aviation Academy in Soroti is charged with embezzling 98 million shillings. And across the border, an assistant minister is investigated in connection with the violence in Tana River County, in which scores of people have been killed. NTV Weekend Edition continues after this short break. See you shortly. know that all music is beautiful and that's why NTV brings you the catalog every day at 2 15 p.m. with the classics on Monday reggae on Tuesday country on Wednesday Africa on Thursday and Love Ballads on Friday. The beautiful sound of music only on NTV, your official music station.
is NTV. To be honest, it's one of the most scary genres of music for me. Welcome back to NTV Weekend Edition. A reminder that in this evening's NTV Weekend Poll, we are asking, what is your assessment of the performance of the Ninth Parliament in its first year? To have your say, text 8778, followed by your name and where you are texting from. We shall be reading some of your comments towards the end of this bulletin, but let's take a look at some of those that have come in so far. And we'll start with Chigi Shadlav Musa, who sums it all up with one word, hypocrites. Another response comes in from Mojimu Duncan Kalenzi, who says he started with a bang, but he's slowly but surely chickening out. Another response comes in from Daniel Biaranga, who says, for the period so far covered, it is very good, but this needs to be tested at the time of amendment of age limit to see whether they can avoid being influenced with the 5 million shillings that the other MPs took. Well, thank you so much for all of your responses. Stay tuned. We shall be bringing you more comments at the tail end of tonight's newscast. Now, the acting director of the East African Civil Aviation Academy in Soroti has been charged with embezzling 98 million shillings and causing financial loss to the academy. Director Bernard Wandera appeared at the anti-corruption court in Kampala today and denied all charges preferred against him. He was granted bail by the magistrate and will appear again in court on 38 of this month. Chris Chamringa reports. Bernard Wandera, the acting director of the Soroti-based East African Civil Aviation Academy, is accused of paying himself 98 million shillings from the academy's coffers and causing financial loss to the institution. Investigations from the Office of the Inspector General of Government indicate that the offence was committed in May last year. But Wandera denied all the charges brought up against him at the anti-corruption court. He was granted bail of 3 million shillings and his three sureties given a bond of 50 million which was not in cash. The case has been adjourned to the 30th of this month as the state attorney carries out more investigations into the case. Chris Ochamringa, NTV. Across the border in Kenya, an assistant minister is being investigated in connection with the violence in Tana River County, in which scores of people have been killed. 52 people, mainly women and children, were killed in the latest revenge attacks on Wednesday. Defense Minister Yusuf Haji, who is also acting in the internal security docket, accused Hadho Godhana of refusing to cooperate with government officials in resolving the root cause of the violence. Meanwhile, a meeting between elders of the two communities and attended by Kenyan security chiefs nearly generated into violence as anger still simmers over the latest killings. A day after 52 people had been slaughtered and buried, the government showed up in full force. None other than the police commissioner himself arrived to chair a peace meeting. But he found an atmosphere that was quite the opposite. What are you telling us? What kind of peace we are discussing? What are we doing now? I'm ready to die. <laughs> Tears flowed freely as locals narrated how women and children were butchered in a brazen attack by people armed with crude weapons and guns. <laughs> The peace meeting itself was interrupted by an alert that yet another village had been attacked. It turned out that it was a false alarm, but this was signal enough that locals are living on edge. MTV made the trek to Reketa village where we were told it was only accessible by air or by wading through reptile infested swamps and rivers. 
that did not deter us, and indeed we found the going tough. At times the water reached as high as the neck, testimony to how challenging life is here even without the strife. We came across many people fleeing from surrounding villages in the wake of the killings. Nearly two hours later, we arrived at Raketa. The entire village was burned down. Some houses lit up with people inside. Ashes and gray walls are all that remain. The field outside are littered with carcasses. Animals slashed alive and left to bleed to death. The entire village is deserted, save for an ailing cow and a stunned lamb, probably wondering why it has been left alone. The remaining creatures are now the scavengers patrolling the killing fields, feeding on the dead. At the edge of the village is a large mound of freshly dug earth. This is the mass grave where 52 men, women and children are buried. And locals believe all these could have been averted. Juzi, nikaenda nikampatia report bwana DC ya kwamba watu thamanini wanatoka ozi na watu wengine wametolewa na boat kutoka mnazini wanakuja ku raid either handaraku ama riketa village wao waliona njia ya kwenda huko ni difficult na hawajui njia wali deploy askari semu ya kau kuelekea chini ya stream ya mto report ya serikali tumewapatia kabla sasa ku deploy wale soldiers ama wale watu ambao wanahusika kwenda hiyo mahali imekuwa ni tatizo it started as a row between pastoralists and farmers but it has now degenerated into a killing exhibition community turning against community majangili wako pande zote pokomo iko nayo orma iko nayo watu iko nayo hata kabla nyingine wako jambaze mbona hatuwasemi Police officers with Elma and Pokomo routes are also set to be transferred amid claims they have taken sides. Ferdinand Mundi, MTV, Tana Delta. Tonight in our weekly political satire, we have the errant members of parliament castigating the cabinet reshuffle. Karamoja MP is crying out to have an equal share of the national cake and the Kilak MP Gilbert Olanya who will do whatever it takes to protect his people's land. Agnes Nandutu brings these stores of humor to your living room. Is it yours? Light off. Hey, hey, hey. I am the man who can just look at the woman and she gets pregnant. Where did you train from? You should leave issues of the generals to the generals. You want another rap? Yeah, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> The long outed Rushaf finally came, and definitely they were winners and losers. Mushinwa Tinka Simire, I can see you displaying the new cabinet chart. Are you happy with President Yuri Museveni's selection? We are still seeing the same old guards. You will never appreciate what your president does for this country. We want to see uh, him removing all these sleeping. Uh, sleeping individuals. Hey, so you remember what happened during the budget speech? They were all. <laughs> we shall not uh, rest until we start seeing the younger brains also occupying uh, these first uh, front seats. Do you hold the same opinion, Moshin Wasechkuba? You bring in people who are extremely, extremely in their 80s. For how long have they served this country? A span of four decades, 40 years in service to the country. You are not allowing them to retire as senior citizens. Okay, okay. What is your message to the head of state? And I challenge the president and the government to not hoodwink Ugandans with a, with, with a cabinet because that cabinet is a sham. This ninth parliament has been rated the best, but to me, it is the most naughty. I'm sorry to say so, honorable members, but you can see even the Karamoja MPs who have just got a tamaka road are here. What is your problem again, honorables? Karamoja is a yellow country. Yes, we know that. And although we are pastoralists economically, but we ideologically we are grounded. 
in this uh, in the NRM party. I'm sure President Yamsuin is happy with that. And as you can see, I'm also putting on a yellow tie. And you are very smart in that yellow tie, Honorable. But my concern is, government has just given you a Tamaka road. What is your problem again? From 86 to date, under NRM, we have not had a full cabinet minister. So, what have you been getting in Karamoja since then? We have always had two state ministers. And is that true, Meshimualepa? Two Arabians for 26 years. Uh-huh. One ambassador, 26 years. Go ahead, Honorable. No undersecretary, no permanent secretary. These are technical positions. Sorry, sorry if that is true. The national cake, oh, we are not understanding this cake, how it is prepared. Of course it was prepared in the bush by 27 brave men and the leader was a man with a vision, President Yoweri Museveni. It is true it was prepared in the bush. 1981 to 86, they were preparing the cake in the bush. But even when you are wedding, you bring the cake to be eaten by the rest of the people you have invited. So, Honorable Halepa, do you want to sit on the table of the high command? We also need to be put within the fora that when we celebrate about the sharing of the cake, we are also part of this cake. I see, I see. Which is political, by the way, not the church cake. I know, but stop speaking in parables and be clear. Which share of the cake do you want? Is it a crime to appoint a Karamojong as a full cabinet minister in this government? Is it a crime? I don't know, but you can consult the NRM manifesto. Why is it written? Is it the Constitution of Uganda? The local government's act that no Karamojong must become a full cabinet minister. Maybe the movement Bible you talked about the other time? I would like to be shown those pages. Ah! Stop bothering me. You talk and talk and talk. That's why I like the Kilaka MP Moshimuya Gilbertolanya. He is not a man of poco, 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 poco all the time. He is a man of action. Touch his people's land and you'll know his true colors. You come to Boba Holland. Focus. Put your thing and be Boba You want. You try to survey his people's land without his authority, you'll face it. Even in the presence of the tear gassing police, he does not fear. Police right now are the agents of land grabbers. We want I don't know. You are the police of Uganda. Yeah, you cannot be the agents of a land grabber. Eh? That is what it means by being a people's MP. You have represented them well, Boshibua. Isn't that a truly Dabana Olara Otunu? This land is our land. From Karamoja to the plains of Amoro. Agnes Nandu too. Point blank. This land was made for you and me. You hear that? <laughs> <laughs>Christine Munike is one of the first women in Uganda to start trading in the car hiring business, which has been completely dominated by men. She started her car hiring business in the early 90s and now has a fleet of almost 50 vehicles. According to Christine, her journey has not been that smooth, but she nonetheless attributes her success to God and plenty of perseverance and self-belief. Maurice Charles spent some time with Christine in this week's prof profile feature. It was quite strange in the 90s to find women who did male-dominated jobs to earn a living. Most people would view you as the most impossible woman who would not even find a man to marry. But one Christine Mwenike beat these odds long before women emancipation came into play. Born in 1963 in a family of nine children, Mwenike was raised up in a family of remote village of Kakule in Budaka district. She also happens to be a sister to Sarah Kataike, the newly appointed state minister of health and general duties. 
Muineke happens to have three children and luckily enough, the firstborn is already married. Mm. She attended school in Kamonkoli Primary School, then later joined St. Catherine in Lira for her secondary level. And then I went to Wairika College for my A-level. Though all was going well with her studies, in her A-level reminisces one of the challenges she went through. My education was interrupted because of the baby and <laughs> it was really a big challenge and I was fearing to go home, what do I do, you know. <laughs> But uh, I went over it, it and I thought that was the end of my life. With all the troubles associated to pregnancy, she managed to pull herself together and return to school after her A-levels in 1986. She then went for a secretary course, where she met one of the first prime ministers of Uganda, Kosma Sadjebo. Stubborn principal, he used not to miss his words, you know, it was very tough. After the two-year study, she worked as an administrator with the Kampala District Administrative Unit. From here, she then decided to go for further studies. I studied uh, with uh, Cambridge Tutorial College. I did a diploma course as well in of office management and business administration. With no vast experience and the right skills to do any business, went for the rather complex but lucrative co-hire business that she did alongside her administrative civil work. In the olden days, such a job would be for men. At the same time I was doing my business center, I said let me try this kind of business as well. So that's how we started the car hire business. Mwinike saw light at the end of the tunnel as she decided to venture into this male-dominated business and the challenges ahead of her were just enormous. There wasn't a lot of really big competition, I must say, because it was, we were very lucky we, we got something immediately. During that time, I, I learned a lot about uh, the car hire business. You know, it was just something small I started <laughs> by getting other people, you know, subcontracting from other people and then supplying the vehicles. She, however, scoffs at people who do business just because someone else is doing it. Though Christine had now acquired over 50 latest cars, competition stiffened at one point and she felt like abandoning this small dominant job. Most of our income was into repairing vehicles. Hiring out the vehicles on self-drive and they still have vehicles. But she remained composed and upgraded her business to a two companies, run one of the most popular lodges in the game parks. Savings from Crystal Travel Service went to Windy and we developed uh, a lodge there. Christine now boasts of a workforce of at least 100 workers who view her as a role model. Assistant, she's not a quitter, and we've learned from her that anything can happen. However, lost her husband three years ago, but this hasn't stopped her from pursuing her dreams as a single mom. And this is what she tells me regarding how she balances work and family. I have to make sure every Sunday I have to stay with my family. And during the week, of course, I go to work and come back home. Apparently, none of her kids have stepped into her shoes, though the last born seems to have interest in her work. I don't think you can force someone to do something which he doesn't like. So I, I think most parents find it a problem, you know, to convince their children to do the kind of business they are doing. Like the saying goes, east or west, home is best. Christine believes that Uganda is the best place to be having gotten the chance to travel around the world. The beginning when people started going to this syndrome of going to do Cheo, yeah. it used maybe to make sense, but now it doesn't make sense. People wow. are staying there illegally. And being a born again Christian, this has driven her to join the Rotary Club where she actively contributes to a number of noble causes. And we have a lot of projects helping people around, you know. For Christine, the sky is the limit as she prepares for more great opportunities ahead. More research all in TV. Well, it's time now for another short break, but just before we go, Joel is in the studio to give us a sneak peek into what's coming up in TV Sport. Joel?
Thank you, Josephine. Now in NTV Weekend Sport is Sports Club Victoria University, the team to reckon with this season. I'll be telling you more up next. Your Saturday afternoons just got better on NTV with Exposed. Join Cats and the Platinum DJs as they bring you some mad DJ skills and crazy video mixes. You're now rocking with the best. Catch us every Saturday as we live. We take you through an experience you'll never forget. Remember to call in with your music requests and also get a chance to win some incredible goodies. That's every Saturday from 1.30pm only on NTV, the station that digs your music. Honest is one of the most scary genres of music for me. For me every day. <laughs> Welcome to NTV Weekend Sport. I am Joel Kamadi. Now, the World Football Governing Body, FIFA, has cautioned players and club officials of participating in the Uganda Super League activities, a body they accuse of disrespect uh, of, mem of their members and the rules governing the game of football. This was during the FIFA annual assembly held in Kampala, where a budget of over $4 billion for next season was passed, as Alfred Odong reports. The World Football Governing Body FIFA has denounced Uganda Super League and cautioned all parties involved in running football in the country of associating with USL. A FIFA delegation of Ashford Mamelodi, Leodega Tenga and led by Primo Cavallo in charge of associate members accused USL leadership of lack of transparency and accountability to its members. We all know that this is where running Uganda football is not right, it's not right. Uganda have two men run our football by themselves. The football reached the football Meanwhile, police were caught up in a fight with this group who said they had come to present their views relating to the management of football in the country. We are demand we, we, we came to talk about our issues as sportsmen. Because we are Ugandan. Do our seat. Sit down. Do our seat. The scaffold saw former players' welfare advocate Dan Mwanguzi and Walusu be arrested as the assembly continued and passed a budget of 4.4 billion shillings for next season. I hope to raise that money from uh, mainly local income, our get collections, and uh, our, our sponsors. The World Football Governing Body is threatening to isolate officials and players who associate with the activities of the Uganda Super League. They are instead encouraging them to take part in the competition sanctioned by the National Football Governing Body, FUFA. Alfred Odong, NTV Sport. Now it goes without saying that newly promoted Sports Club Victoria University will be a force to reckon with when the Football League kicks off next month. The club have acquired the services of former Sofa Park and Express coach Sam Simba, who recently guided Ugandan Super League side Express FC to their first title in 16 years. And with teams spending a considerable amount of money in preparation for the season, the university side is not being left behind. 
The new Super League entrance on Wednesday unveiled 11 new signings for the 2012-2013 season. The club will be making its debut in the league and can count on the services of their big-name signings to give them an edge in competing against other established teams. Former Express FC coach Sam Simbra will relish the challenge to coach the star-studded side, who also announced the signing of 30-year-old former partisan Belgrade ace Nestor Kizito as the team captain. Simbra recently guided Ugandan Super League side Express FC to their first title in 16 years and will be hoping for a repeat of his exploited Sofa Parker, who finished first on their inaugural season. Now I am joined here in the studio tonight by Ivan Zorich, head coach at Sports Club Victoria University. A very warm welcome to NTV Weekend Sport. Now, mm -hmm. coach, how are you preparing the team for its first season in the Super League? I have my plan and program of work of eight weeks. And uh, by this plan and program of preparation, I'm uh, working with my team, always uh, using the same formula for each team. All right, now you uh, have signed coach. Okay. Now you have signed so many very experienced players and talented uh, players of this. Should we expect the team to go for the title this season? Uh, a little difference. All these players, you are right, is experience and uh, full of potential players. But these individual qualities, to create a team to implement these individual qualities into team purpose needs some time. Of course, uh, our approach for every game is going to be to win, but we are going to finish at the position what we deserve at the end of the season by our performance and performing on the pitch. All right. So the club recently acquired the services of coach Sam Simba who we know has a very good record with uh, clubs in Uganda and across the board, border in Kenya. How is it working with him? It's very good. We have a really excellent cooperation. Uh, uh, I want uh, the best player in my team. Also, I want the best staff in my technical staff. That means this is, by, uh, this is one logic move, what we decide in in the club to same thing by approach to us to mix the local experience with uh, my outside experience i think this is a good formula and winning formula to for the this season now for the time you have been in uganda what can you say about the country's talent uh uganda definitely have a talents many many talented players but have uh, one problem. Uh, what is more like in Uganda is a really, really professional soccer academy. Because uh, in uh, most of the world, when the kids starting to play in the football, starting from fifth or sixth year to training the football, seriously training, uh, you cannot skip uh, you from elementary school to go to the college, of course. I think in the most case, uh, this is situation is here. Players starting to play football about 16, 17, and uh, now when they come to 21 in the world, in the Europe, the coach expect a finished product, complete player. And uh, I think if uh, provide to these kids a little better infrastructure, and uh, it will be established some professional soccer academy, not one, many professional soccer academy. I can, I think the Uganda can be a very, very significant factor in Africa and world football. Thank you very much, Coach, for your time here. Thank you very much, also. Now I have been speaking to Coach uh, Ivan Zoric of Sports Club Victoria University. Now in international sport, uh, Barcelona came from behind to take a slender lead from the first leg of the Spanish Super Copa at the new Camp and elsewhere Lance Armstrong has been stripped of his seven Tour de France titles and given a lifetime ban by the United States Anti-Doping Agency. 
Cristiano Ronaldo headed Real into the lead against the run of play 10 minutes into the second half from Mesut Ozil's corner, but Barcelona responded as Pedro showed great poise to slot home a minute later. The action then raced from end to end, and it was the hosts who forged ahead 20 minutes from time when Lionel Messi scored from the penalty spot after Sergio Ramos had brought down Andres Iniesta. Then a terrific jinking run from Iniesta freed Xavi to stroke home Barcelona's third goal seven minutes later. And the two magicians, Iniesta and Xavi, link up to put daylight between the big two. However, the visitors were gifted a way back into the tie five minutes from time when Barcelona goalkeeper Victor Valdez tried to dribble around Angel Di Maria and only succeeded in gifting the Argentinian an open goal. Johan Blake ran his quickest 100 meters on Thursday night to go level with American Tyson Gay as the second fastest man of all time but revealed he was not at his best. His time of 9.69 seconds in the Diamond League meeting in Lausanne matched Gay's time from 2009 and is bettered only by his training partner Usain Bolt. Bolt himself was not troubled on his way to a 200 meter victory in 19.58 seconds with Chirani Martina of the Netherlands second with 19.85 and Jamaican Nicole Ashmid third with 19.94. Finally, seven time Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong faces being stripped of his titles and banned from cycling for life after announcing he will not contest charges leveled by the United States Anti Doping Agency. American Armstrong said in a statement that he is finished with this nonsense and insisted he is innocent but did not want to spend any further effort clearing his name. However, Armstrong's achievements are said to be wiped from the record books. He has always denied claims he ever used performance enhancing drugs during his career and has never failed a test. And that winds up NTV Weekend Spot for tonight. Back to you, Josephine. Thank you, Joel. Let's take a short break. I'll be back with your comments from tonight's NTV Weekend Poll. It's party time every day at 4.30 p.m. Feel the music. Try out your favorite dance strokes. Watch the latest music videos from artists around the world as you dance to the beat. Girl, you got me screaming fiesta. Body language saying whatever. Only on The Beat, Monday to Friday on MTV, your official groove station. It's party time every day at 4.30 p.m. Feel the music. Fieldwork has been defined by different scholars. Some think it is an art. These are the blood types that are in human beings. We have A. When a chemical reaction takes place, it involves two things. We are given a straight line that has been denoted by 2x minus y is equal to 6. Welcome back to Minibuzz. Welcome back. Now a reminder that in tonight's NTV Weekend Poll, we asked you what is your assessment of the performance of the ninth parliament in its first year. Well, thank you so much for all of your responses. A quick look at some more. We start with David Lutalo, who says, I give them credit for ignoring the interest of, uh, of their parties and working for the interest of the voters. Another response comes in from Dennis Sechito, who says, Fair, although some few elements need to have a heart for their country and stop acting selfishly. 
Uh, Martin Tumishere says, I don't expect much from people who query other people's salaries, and yet they just keep increasing theirs. How disappointing. And finally, Nathan Were says, the ninth parliament has helped to check the government excesses. Government has been able to take action on some corrupt leaders. And that is Nathan in Dar es Salaam. Well, thank you so much for all of your responses. Let's take a quick look at the weather forecast for tomorrow. For the report brings us to the end of tonight's newscast. But I'll be back tomorrow, same time, same place. So keep it right here with NTV. I'm Josephine Karunji. Good night. is part of the antelope genus and is native to western, central, eastern and southern Africa. It has a reddish brown shaggy coat which progressively grows darker with maturity and a white bib under the throat. It is generously covered with thin brownish oily grease that has a distinct musky odor. It's easily recognized by a distinctive white band on the rump encircling the tail and the long bow-shaped ringed horns of the male which go up to a hundred centimeters long.